Thanks for joining us today. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Iti Hirum. We have a lot lined up for you today, so let's get started with the day's highlights. Korea, China and Japan meet and agree to assess spillovers and risks to the Asian economy amid slowing global economic growth. What stories made headlines in global business news this week? The U.S. Fed Reserve releases minutes from its September meeting, while Germany's exports plunge amid the ongoing investigation into the Volkswagen scandal. Korea, China and Japan say that they will work on expanding regional financial ties. They have also vowed to closely coordinate to monitor risky developments in the market, while Korea's finance chief also called for support for a Seoul-led regional development bank. Our Shin se starts us off. The finance chiefs of Korea, China and Japan have agreed to gauge the spillover effects and risks to the regional economy in light of lower-than-expected global economic growth. Meeting on the sidelines of the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors gathering in Peru on Thursday, the three sides discussed ongoing economic developments, including falling growth prospects and the recent market volatility. They also agreed to clearly communicate actions aimed at fostering confidence in their respective financial markets. On top of that, the ministers discussed ways to further develop regional financial cooperation within the ASEAN Plus 3 and said they would work together to ensure financial stability. Korea's finance minister Che Kyung hwan also asked for China and Japan's support for the establishment of Seoul's envisioned Northeast Asia Development Bank. The bank would be designed to support North Korea's economic development in exchange for Pyongyang's denuclearization with the help of other member nations from the so-called six-party nuclear talks, which include China and Japan. Thursday's meeting was the second between the three ministers this year. It's hoped that the talks laid the groundwork for a successful summit between the leaders of the three countries. The summit is expected to be held in Seoul at the end of this month or in early November. Shin Se-min, Business Daily. And the president of the World Bank Group says he will back the establishment of a new Asian development bank led by the South Korean government if the two Koreas are able to resolve mutual security and political issues. Tim Yong Kim made the statement during talks with Seoul's finance minister Che Kyung Hwan on the sidelines of the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting, which is being held in Lima, Peru this week. Noting that he comes from a separated family from the Korean War, the World Bank chief showed interest in the envisioned Northeast Asian Development Bank. Minister Che said the bank would be designed to support North Korea's economic development in exchange for Pyongyang's denuclearization with the help of other member nations from the so-called six-party nuclear talks. Meanwhile, Korea's finance minister Che kyung hwan also met with global credit appraiser Moody's chief credit officer during his trip to Lima. In a meeting on the sidelines, Che expressed hopes that Moody's will mark up Korea's sovereign credit rating in the near future and outlined the government's firm commitment to push forward with sweeping structural reforms and its drive to revive the economy. The credit ratings agency back in April upgraded Korea's ratings outlook from stable to positive. And with Korea looking to join the recently concluded Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal, a former White House official says Korea actually has a good chance of becoming a member, but that it'll take some time for that to happen. Our Oh Young tells us more. For the past few weeks, Korea has expressed keen interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. However, joining the world's largest trading bloc may prove to be less than straightforward, according to Matthew Goodman, a former White House official. Speaking to a local news agency on Thursday, he said that Korea should be on the top of the list in terms of gaining membership, but that it's too late to join the first round. Having reached a landmark deal this week, it's likely that the 12 member countries will take a year or two to ratify terms before considering new members for the second round. Goodman said Korea should have joined the TPP in the beginning stages of negotiations, as it would have largely benefited from the historic agreement, which accounts for more than a quarter of the world's trade volume. This means Korea will be excluded from the tariff cuts on nearly 18,000 categories and increased access to markets with a combined population of almost 800 million. 
The former White House official also said that missing out on these benefits will have negative effects on the Korean economy, but are unlikely to be seriously damaging. However, he emphasized it is in Korea's best interest to become a part of the regional bloc. So just what will it take? Goodman says Korea will have to show it's willing to achieve high standards and substantial liberalization. Oh Seung, Business Daily. Apple's latest addition to its iPhone series, the iPhone 6S and iPhone 6S Plus, will be unveiled in Korea starting October 23rd through the country's three largest mobile carriers. Pre-orders are expected to start on October 16th, which is next Friday, with the phones costing anywhere between $800 to $1,170. Now, these iPhones are going to come out in four colors, silver, gold, space gray, and rose gold. Industry watchers say Apple's release of its latest products will present challenges to Samsung and LG Electronics, and there are speculations that both firms will lower their gadget prices to prevent Apple from further expanding its market share here in Korea. A government report studying sales trends at big and small retailers indicates that August sales surged for convenience stores here in Korea. And this boost in sales is said to be mostly due to one popular item. Here's our Lee Young with more. This is a typical convenience store in downtown Seoul. It's one of the 25,000 stores operating around the clock nationwide, which saw an average 34% boost in August sales compared to the same time last year. Spearheading the increase was a significant boost in cigarette sales. According to the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy, cigarette sales in August at convenience stores nationwide jumped 68.1%, up by a larger margin compared to instant and fresh foods and processed foods. In terms of proportion, sales generated from cigarette buyers took up 44 percent of total sales, gradually increasing since June this year. This is despite higher taxes slapped on cigarettes by the government at the start of this year in a bid to reduce smoking. Experts say sales have returned to similar levels before the price hike, indicating that the near twofold increase in prices did not manage to curb people's appetite for smoking as much as initially planned. On the other hand, August was not a good month for large supermarkets and department stores as sales declined around 7 percent, respectively. But spending has been picking up following the country's Thanksgiving Chuseok holiday and a government-launched Black Friday sales event that contributed to a surge in the double digits. Lee Ju-young, Business Daily. It's Friday, meaning it's time to look through some of the global business stories that made headlines this week. And for that, we're joined by our Eunice Kim in the studio. Hi, Eunice. Hi, to you. All right. So the U.S. Fed Reserve earlier today released its minutes from the September meeting. Mm -hmm. What can we glean from there? Well, the general sentiment we are getting from this is just the posture of the Fed. That is that there is no great urgency, it seems, among policymakers to raise interest rates. So, uh, And this is especially in light of lingering global risks, of course. And this did send Asian stocks up on this Friday, as well as the U.S. dollar falling. Markets here in Korea, though, did close on this Hunger Day holiday. Now, Federal Reserve officials noted that economic conditions in the U.S. had reached or were near their goals, but they were concerned with growing global risks, mainly from China, and how they would spill over to depress the U.S. economy and the Fed's 2 percent inflation goal as well. Thus, the committee decided to be prudent and wait for further data that would confirm that America's recovery was indeed on that upward continuum. Mm -hmm. And also overnight, the president of Volkswagen U.S. testified before Congress mm. on the Volkswagen's emissions rigging scandal. And I hear that he actually said that this is the work of a few rogue individuals. That's right. He said to his understanding, this was not a corporate problem, uh, a position that was received with great skepticism by U.S. lawmakers who were questioning them present at that congressional hearing. CEO Michael Horn 
more and also acknowledged it could take years to fix the affected diesels. Let's go ahead and take you there. It was the first time a Volkswagen executive stood for a public reckoning in the country that caught the automaker's willful deception more than a month ago. Facing tough questioning by U.S. lawmakers Thursday local time, the German automaker's U.S. chief apologized for betraying customers' trust. But he denied allegations that the decision to install the now infamous defeat device in VW's diesel vehicles originated from the company's upper echelons. First of all, the investigations are ongoing, but this was not a corporate decision. From my point of view, and to my best knowledge today, the corporation in no board meeting or no supervisory board meeting has authorized this, but this was a couple of software engineers who put this in for whatever reasons. Horn went on to say three top engineers have since been suspended, but the suggestion that headquarters was completely blindsided did not bode well with his audience. VW is trying to get the United States of America to believe these are a couple of rogue engineers, I categorically reject that. On the same day, German prosecutors raided Volkswagen's headquarters and homes of some employees as part of their criminal investigation. On the recalls, VW America's Horn said he expects fixing the 430,000 affected vehicles will take years, as Volkswagen is looking to retrofitting the diesels in addition to a software update in order to meet U.S. requirements and keep the car's fuel efficiency. Well, Eunice, sounds like there's still a long way to go for this German car maker. That's right. But there are other headlines coming out of Germany, and we hear that the European powerhouse's August uh, export figures are actually in, and they dropped significantly, more than expected. That's right, because analysts were expecting a less than 1% drop, 0.9% to be exact. But what actually came out for August on month is a 5.2% drop than what it was in July. Now, Germany's Federal Statistical Office said seasonally adjusted exports in August came to 97.7 uh, billion euros. That's about 150 billion U.S. dollars, and that is the steepest fall the country has seen in nearly seven years since January of 2009. This is being attributed to weaker demand from emerging economies like China, but of course there's Still the question of how the Volkswagen scandal will impact the German economy, of which a third is supported by exports and of which 17 percent are car sales. Chancellor Angela Merkel, in fact, earlier today warned against uh, lumping uh, into one company's misconduct against Germany's entire automobile industry, which, of course, supports many, many jobs. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I hear that Germany's Deutsche Bank is actually bracing itself for a massive windfall in the third quarter. That's right. Yeah, wrap your brain around this figure. 6.2 billion euros. That's about $7 billion. That is the amount Deutsche Bank is expecting to lose in the third quarter. Order. And to offset costs, the bank said it will either cut or scrap dividend payments to its investors for this year. That is a first since 2009. It'll also take huge write downs and has set aside money for future litigation. Two months earlier, then incoming CEO John Cryan had announced plans to downsize Europe's largest investment bank, plans that would include shedding a quarter of its staff, that is 23,000 employees, this according to Reuters. All right, Eunice, and before we let you go, you have a couple more headlines for us. Yeah, I do. We learned this week that China's currency, the yuan, actually exceeded the Japanese yen, supplanting it as the fourth most used currency in the world economy. A statement by the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications said the shift happened in August when the share of transactions denominated in the yuan grew to a record 2.79 percent compared to the yen's very close 2.76. Overtaking seven currencies over the past three years, the yuan now only follows the U.S. dollar, the euro, and the British pound. And this does come as the IMF is soon expected to review currencies that make up its special drawing rights basket, which happens only twice a decade. 
And finally, software giant Microsoft turns its eyes to hardware. At a company launch event in New York City, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella and his team unveiled a stash of new products, including a line of Lumia smartphones, a wearable fitness tracker, and its first laptop, all which will run on Windows 10. Many eyes were on the Surface Book, a laptop which unhooks to become a tablet, which the company said boasts speed twice as fast as that of Apple's MacBook Pro and features a trackpad made of glass. Wow, and you know, I think the Surface Book sounds like a good option for people who can't choose between a laptop and a tablet. Yeah, you get the best of both, and people, uh, experts who are re reviewing it are saying this is a true laptop as opposed to a tablet, tablet. pretending to be mm -hmm. a laptop. Well, let's see what these ga new gadgets can bring Microsoft against this rival Apple yeah. and its gadgets. We'll see. All right, thank you so much for coming in today, Eunice. You bet. And that wraps it up for today and this week. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back next week with more, so don't forget to tune in then. Thanks so much for watching, and have a great weekend.